my name is Joanna, but everyone calls me Jo. And I am a postdoc at ANU, and I work very closely with Professor Janssen Ping. And I have this job, before I met Janssen, I used to think of the world as a point. Now I think of the world as a PDF. So um, <laughs> I would also like to thank the organizers and the coordinators of this program, Chiske, um, Paco, Josh, John, and uh, Peter, for helping uh, me get here and uh, give you this talk. Now, at this point in the, in the program, you might think, Joe, you didn't get the memo. First, large language models, and now uh, stellar spectra when we're here at the uh, conference about galaxy evolution. But the way I think about it is, is that I think the universe kind of talked to us in fractals. So we use, we think of galaxies as useful tracers for the evolution of the universe, for our, for our ability to understand the universe. In a similar sense, I think of stars as very useful tracers that allow us to understand the, the galaxy, especially our galaxy's evolution. So what happens is that in the last uh, few decades, um, we have had access to a lot of high resolution stellar spectra that gave us information about the chemical abundances that are present in the atmospheres of stars. These data set are these data sets are just going to get bigger and bigger. By mid-2025, we'll have access to around 5 million stellar spectra. So that is a tremendous amount of information. Modern multi-object spectrographs will give us more than 1,000 spectra per exposure. This amount of data poses a very important question. How do we analyze it? Um, yes, I was supposed to do that before, but anyway. <laughs> So machine learning, of course, comes to mind because machine learning is also the art of using big data. So far, in machine, in machine learning was applied to the, the study of the stellar spectra called stellar spectroscopy in a in mostly supervised way. Um, but, uh, and, but I think it's important, so before I go there, um, I think it's important to actually think about another pattern. So stellar spectra here on the x-axis, you have the wavelengths. On the y-axis, you have the normalized flux. So we have these pixels, right, of uh, fluxes. Uh, this is very similar to images. And in the image net set, for example, here we have each image has of the order of 10,000 pixels. And it belongs to uh, one of the multi-classes, strawberry, cat, star, uh, chat GPT, uh, not yet. In the case of stellar spectra, here we have 10,000 wavelength pixels, and we can use this, uh, this spectra to obtain the temperature, the gravity, um, uh, the global metallicity, the ages, the chemical abundances of stars. And of course, this information is paramount because it allows us to understand the evolution of our galaxy and use that as a pro for the study of other galaxies in the universe. We are normally, is there any way to highlight? Uh, doesn't matter. 2050 labels here uh, we can get from the study of, stellar spec of a particular stellar spectrum. And yeah, so the way this uh, machine learning was applied to stellar spectroscopy so far was, okay, we have the spectrum, we're going to map it to these uh, labels, and in the process say something about the, the evolution of um, our galaxy. However, uh, this has a few caveats. First of all, um, so yeah, uh, first of all, we have so what happens here is that um, in order for us to get these um, labels, we have to use some sort of synthetic spectral model. So we actually feed these models to the spectra, and you know we tweak the parameters until these models fit the spectra, and then we have our label space. And then we use those labels to train machine learning models. But this, there, this actually is a bit problematic, because if, the, the, if there are issues with the synthetic spectral models, then these issues are going to propagate in our predictions. So in this project, Janssen and I were pretty much thinking, OK, how do we bypass this? How do we actually uh, not do machine learning in a supervised sense, but actually in an unsupervised uh, way? And we proposed MENDIS. So MENDIS is pretty much a large generative model that is aiming to understand and model the probability distribution uh, space uh, spanned by stellar spectra. Um, and I think the important point here is that we don't need to project into a label space first, um, which also allows us to find outliers in directly working in the probability space of stellar spectra, and hopefully find some stranger spectra yeah, in the process. So for our choice, this project was done more than a year ago. Back, back then, diffusion model didn't really hit, I think, quite as much astronomy community as it does today. And at the time, normalizing flows were actually one of the top 
of choices we had to model very complicated probability distribution functions. And in here, what happens is this normalizing flow, it's a very big deep generative model, and I'm pretty sure Chris is gonna tell you more about it tomorrow. Um, but we're pretty much trying to get a P model of as similar as possible to the process that generated our data. And unlike variational autoencoders, in this case, we have exact likelihood evaluation. And the intuition here is that you have a complicated probability space. And what you want to do is you want to move into a simpler probability space in a very meaningful way. And the way we do that is you use, um, use a well-designed neural network that has certain properties. So this neural network has to be invertible, so it allows us to move between our, our random variable X that has a very complicated PDF to a Z that has a very simple uh, PDF such as a Gaussian, right? And then we want to go back because once we, for example, do some magic in Z, so for example, we see you know, we want to generate uh, under the Gaussian, we want to go back to X. So in this case, we want to sample uh, more from X. But we, we need a way to connect, to talk between these two spaces. And uh, the training task here is quite straightforward. We want to ma minimize the, uh, the, the, the negative log likelihood, which, you know, if we, that, that we can actually get F of theta, we have those parameters as a neural network and we're just back propagating to get uh, the, 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 the optimum values. Right, so in our project here, what we did is we, oh, sorry, <laughs> we generated a lot of spectra. So I want to say a caveat of this project is that we actually did not apply this to real data. This is all done on um, generated data because we wanted to have sort of a, 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 like we wanted to test if this model actually could work in the first place. So we had the stellar spectra, we generated a bunch of them using Janssen's brilliant uh, uh, pain uh, library. So we did that, and then we also took the conditional variables there. By conditional variables, I mean temperature, metallicity, and surface gravity. And then we put all of this, we put all of this 2000, 4008 dimension information through a very large and deep uh, normalizing flow that whose architecture is pretty much guided by uh, an agnormalization transfer, a convolutional one, on, one by one transform here and the neural spline flow. And the first one is there because it actually helps uh, your convergence during training. The second one is because it pretty much like permutes your input data so the model sees more of your data per, per, um, per unit. And the last one is the one that's actually, I would say, the one that is like the, the one that um, allows you to uh, mod, to like pretty much like, uh, it's express, it, it is very expressive. So this PDF, this complicated PDF, in order to move it into a simpler PDF, you need to compress it and change it and stretch it in meaningful ways. So you need very powerful transforms for that. So that's what the neural spline flow does. And I'm very happy to talk to you more over the blackboard um, because it's actually quite a fascinating and beautiful mathematical, elegant mathematical solution how they achieve this. And once we move, for example, once we've taken this complicated PDF, we moved into a simpler one. In this, in here, we can actually look for outliers detection. So points that have very, very low likelihood under this distribution. Cool. But uh, the cool thing is, before we do any science, we, uh, any science with machine learning, we need to think about science that, uh, the, the science that underpins stellar evolution. Uh, and we know stars, you know, they come in different flavors there. We have very hot stars and we have cool stars. And depending on their temperature um, and surface gravity and metallicity, they have a different spectrum. So in this case, what happens is that this uh, pretty much, if we wanted to do any sort of inference at the level of generated spectra, we would need to actually condition on these three variables that can actually change your spectra, uh, change the uh, elemental correlation structure in your spectra. Okay, so I think, I think this is pretty much um, what I want you to take away from my talk. We had a small thesis to start with when we just wanted to do this project. So the thesis is that lines of the same element see each other via correlation, assuming that you have conditioned on the stellar parameters. So in other case, if you have some magnesium in your star, you know, you have, uh, you have um, um, like the absorption lines associated with the magnesium um, element. And if you increase your magnesium, all of the lines should feel the same effect. So in that sense, you should have correlation. 
Now, what happens is that I had to train this model because I wanted to do exactly the same thing. I wanted to, gener to learn the PDF of the stellar spectra, um, and then to, once I did that, I wanted to generate from PZ and then go back to P of X and condition on temperature of G and uh, metallic, once I conditioned on those, and just pretty much look at the elemental um, correlation structure. So in here on, on this plot here on the X and Y axis, you have the indexes of these uh, uh, wavelength pixels. And I wanted to look at this structure here and understand if I can find hidden atomic lines. So the problem is that this model is exceptionally hard to train uh, because this is quite a high dimensionality for a normalizing flow. So 90% of the time was spent on actually uh, paralyzing the model to run across 16 GPUs. But once we were able to do that, we actually were able to sample millions and millions of spectra. And here in this plot here, you have generated spectra on up there and on the uh, lower plot, you have the training spectra. So you see that it's actually able to recover very well um, the signal. And this is already, this is zoomed in on like 400 pixels. But if you look across the entire range of 2,000, 2,405 pixels, you're still actually recovering a pretty fair, um, pretty fair generated spectra compared to the training. Um, cool. So quite cool, like I give you a really nice uh, co uh, correlation matrix here between the wavelength pixels. We look at it, it's very sweet, but we can't really say much about it because it's quite messy. So what we do here, we go back to graphs, and I'm pretty sure Christian is gonna give you a very nice introduction to those. Uh, and then we pretty much say, if you are, if you are pixel I and you're, you're talking to another pixel J uh, via correlation greater than 0 point weight, uh, be together, find each other and, and be together, um, in like uh, group them together like that and we can represent this as a graph uh, a graph structure and then for each graph we can actually get its adjacency matrix and pretty much use that to actually reorder the, the original matrix so in that sense we've taken the information present here we have pretty much ordered it in a meaningful way and we're able to actually identify that you know the titanium lines talk to the titanium lines in the spectra and the uh, uh, aluminium lines, they talk to the aluminium lines in the spectra, the cobalt as well. So this is kind of a nice result uh, that we can actually identify the main elemental families present in, stellar, in the stellar spectra that we modeled. Here on the, on the uh, you have the correlation as, uh, uh, in the, in the um, color bar. Okay, so this is cool because this allows us to try to imagine ways where we can solve the atom. Of course, I'm not divine, I'm not gonna be that arrogant, but this, actually, this kind of tools can actually be good if we want to identify, for example, new uh, atomic physics. And finding new absorption, finding new lines is very difficult in the lab. But with stars, we have access to so much data and we're gonna have to access to so much more data. So I would say this is kind of a viable route to try to identify nice. So you can imagine here that you have an unknown pixel X that shows a strong strong correlation with regards to titanium, you could argue that that, a condition, assuming that you've conditioned all the possible other sources of correlation, you, um, you could say that that is also a titanium line as well. So that's exactly what I was trying to say, but of course you also see that some lines are blended. So we also have to um, discuss and identify ways to, to take this into account, and this is work in progress for my younger peers, I assume Mate and you. So yeah, this is work in progress. Another thing is how about outliers? So as I said to you, you know, you have complicated space uh, PDF of X and you're moving into PZ, is PZ simpler? Uh, how about if you find uh, outliers in PZ? So there are many unique objects in the universe. There are really cool stuff waiting to be discovered with LSST, with JWST, with all the wonderful telescopes that we have coming up. Uh, black holes, we have possible for stars, three stars, so using our, um, uh, so using pain, we are able to pretty much generate all of these, some of these unique stars that we think we have in the Milky Way. So for example, we have the carbon rich metal poor star, the strip stars or the rapidly rotating stars. And then we pretty much pass these new stars under the model that we have trained for our normal spectra. And under this model that was trained for our training stars, uh, most of these, uh, most of these uh, objects actually had quite a low lo uh, uh, likelihood. And this is not, of course, this is not exactly 
uh, going to give you the exact, there are many papers now that discuss how well you can use normalizing flow for finding outliers. But to first degree, it's actually quite encouraging to see that once you generate it like outliers and you pass them under the, under the model, you are still recovering outliers. So this is quite encouraging for the future. Uh, in summary, I would say that I, I have this approach that everything has to be done in balance. So supervised learning for stellar spectroscopy is exceptionally important and is exceptionally powerful because that's a very viable way for us to get the chemical abundances and the temperatures for many millions of stars. But at the same time, I would say now with the advent of large generative models, we are in a prime position to try to do unsupervised learning on the stellar spectra to explore the high dimensional space. Um, and of course, the two main applications that Janssen and I were thinking about and that we discussed in our paper, um, submitted, uh, accepted by ICML workshop, were to study atomic physics. And we proved that this is actually, this is a cool MVP, it's a good enough MVP. So in theory, you could actually find atomic physics, you know, new lines, new hidden lines. And also we can identify the outlier detection, um, outliers in the spectra. And the future is bright. So application to millions of real spectra, this is pretty much the next step for this type of approach. So we've done it, we've made sure that it works on synthetic spectra, but of course uh, the limits of our models are, you know, um, quite, uh, you, they need to work on real data as well. So this is the, the next step and I'm pretty sure we have some brilliant students working on this already. Um, all right, so before I go, um, I spent quite a bit of time during this workshop talking to all the brilliant people here uh, about uh, what can we do with GPT-4 for, for, for example, for science, right? So um, I would say that as a community, we use images and we use CNN for images and we extract quite important information for those. And then we also look at time series. We have all these beautiful mathematical objects that describe how uh, properties change with time as uh, Dalia said earlier. But I also say that a lot of our information is actually in the language that we use to describe all that we observe. So why not actually think of ways as a community to, um, to use that to make our lives a bit easier. So this project actually did it because I was too lazy to read the paper about Goldberg cluster. So I just wanted to learn them in some way, not learn them, but just query them intelligently in some way. Um, so uh, I could actually talk to them and get that information faster. But uh, yeah, I think it's work in project and progress and I'm very happy to take questions on that. And I also want to talk, thank Sultan for believing in the project, the infamous project number nine. Thank you very much. So that's it. Thank you so much. And questions? I guess we'll start right here. Thank you, Joe. Uh, really exciting. I was, uh, sorry, this is Martin Ray. I was partly striking by your connection with atomic physics. I think I'm lacking some intuition there. How many, so in your example where you're saying this could be, we could detect new titanium lines and so on. How many of these lines, no. Like what are the actual detection prospects for this? And is, the, is it because we can't compute them uh, we know that they should be there, but we don't know how much they are, or we, we're limited by some quantum mechanics calculations, or do we just don't know that they exist in the first place? I think it's a, that, that's a very good question, Martin. Thank you very much. I think we are somewhere, um, I think getting this, doing these experiments in the lab uh, from first principles is very, very com expensive. So you, you need, these are quantum calculations which I'm not very um, knowledgeable in, but I know that doing this kind of lab physics where it's very, very tough. So using stars as a way to find them is actually a more indirect route, possibly less expensive and less, um, less difficult route to get them. Um, in terms of predictions, I don't know how to answer there. So I probably would probably need to check that. Um, yeah. More. yeah. Any other questions? Hi Joe, thanks for amazing talk. I don't know if you saw um, sort of uh, more general correlations between say alpha elements um, on like, yeah, the maybe not as strong with, as within individual elements, but on, you know, families of elements, for example. Um, yeah, that's something I didn't think about at the time, but uh, that's actually, yeah, that I think that can be done, of course. You can identify uh, sort of, uh, ascertain the correlation structure in, in families of families, I guess. Uh, I just didn't look at it, but that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, 
Thank you. I think maybe that one's closer. Hey, Joe. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, this is Dalia. Um, I was wondering, um, so I'm not super familiar with uh, normalizing flow, so mm -hmm. I'm sorry if my question is a bit basic, no, it's... but I'm trying to understand how are similarities assigned between your spectra and whether adjacent pixels are treated as independent yes. and how will you generalize it to a case where you have a spectral resolution, line blending, and things like this? That's a very good question. Indeed, we are, uh, we are modeling PXI, where I goes from one to how many pixels we have in our spectra. So these are modeled, this, the joint probability distribution is being modeled. Um, and uh, in terms of, um, so I, I think I missed uh, Uh, that is a very good question. I, I didn't do that test, uh, but I did one test where we injected noise into the spectra and we still recovered the correlation matrix. It was just a bit washed, but the, the, the main structure was still there. I didn't I, I didn't test how and how like that if you know if you weaken a line, how would that change the emergent uh, correlation spectra but uh, spectra structure? But that's something yeah that has something that we need to do uh, because that is real data. So yeah, I just didn't do it. We can, yeah, thank you, yeah. Other questions? Hey, thank you for your talk. Um, very, very interesting. And um, kind of building on top of other questions. Uh, so similarly to looking at like the, the correlation between alpha elements, do you think you could, would it be possible to see if there's new correlations that would basically open up uh, different wavelength regimes to find tracers for uh, specific elements or specific, uh, like for, for example, for the alpha elements, mm -hmm. to explore whether there are additional lines that you could use in different wavelength regimes that haven't been used before? I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you can probably introduce that into the model and see how much better your model is able to. Uh, yeah, is that mean, if that's what yeah. you're asking, Chisgar? Actually, I think what I mean is, can you use your model to find correlations that would give you, like, oh, if you make a narrow band here, you actually have an additional tracer of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I like need to think how of, magnesium lines are used for as a proxy for metallicity or whatever. To give but you then in expanding this in in wavelength. Yeah, I mean, my first intuition is to say yes, uh, but I I think I need a bit more time to think about it in how how to adapt it to that regime. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a generative model, so it should probably be able to uh, ex use that information in some meaningful way. Um, yeah. Thanks. We can talk more about this. It's, we can talk more. Okay. Hey, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you could comment a bit more on uh, the prospect of uh, detecting outliers uh, by looking at low likelihood, you know, mm -hmm. solutions. Because I mean, we, with what we've done is that sometimes, you know, in most of the likelihood is driven by noise. The, the noise pixels contain a lot of information, and sometimes you might be in a situation in which uh, a spectra completely dominated by noise or a data point it's, has higher likelihood that something that has more lines or something because it's easier to reproduce. So you are in a situation in which, uh, you know, yeah, so noise gets more likelihood than signal. And I've been seeing this at least in images a lot. So I don't know if we, you've seen similar things. We ha I, I know that I've done the test with outlier looking at like noise less and noisy, uh, the noisy regime with like incremental amounts of noise. And I was still able to identify the outliers in that sense. But I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I did it in the, I didn't use the same treatment that you're proposing, which is uh, pretty much evaluate noise under a noiseless model, which is something that I have to do. Yeah, I think. So I was just thinking, um, so what you see, for example, the regressive models on images is that you take, you train a, a regressive model on the uh, large images, 
Yeah. You, sorry, you take a galaxy, uh, an ultra regressive model in galaxy images, uh, it provides a likelihood, and then you ask what is the likelihood of a pure noise image, and it's yeah. higher than if there's a galaxy in it, because you know it's easier for the model to reproduce pure uh, noise. And so at the end, uh, and you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, this is something I haven't like done empirically, but like looking, like just thinking, um, I would say that these are quite expressive models, so they are able to bound the space in which each of these pixels live. So I would say that if you have, you're looking at like a joint, like you're looking PX, like uh, product over that uh, in some way. So I think if you have noise, I would hope that it would be uh, not quite as, um, can I quickly re respond? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, respond. Yeah, yeah, like, if you just... go back to the likelihood plot, the outliers, I, yeah, I think like this is like, oh yeah, I'm Johnson. Um, just, it's related to what like Peter say, because in the high dimensional space, the likelihood is actually like quite sharp in one value, mm -hmm. which is what we also show in the first plot, right? So the training like data, they have the likelihood that it's not the highest, but it's very like, sharply peaked. But you're right that if we sort of like, like just pass through noise, the likelihood might be higher, but it's not at the, the ring of likelihood, right? So meaning that the normal spectra all have like a very like similar uh, uh, likelihood, yeah. So things that are higher or lower, they are both outliers. Ah, I see. Yeah. You can have, uh, okay. Yeah. But you can have higher likelihood. I, I guess, so we haven't passed through like noise, but it's mm. an interesting question. If we pass through a white noise, what would Yeah, happen? I think, yeah, I think we need, yeah. we need to check how that would look like, yeah. If it's higher than the if it's higher than the normal spectrum, I have an issue. But can we do one more question while Christian gets set up? Anyone? I can ask a question. No, go, go ahead and go ahead and get set up. Oh no! Hi. Um. I was wondering, do you continue to subtract? everything before analyzing this stellar spectra? And do you treat equally blue and red stars? Uh, yes, I mean, yeah. Um, we, uh, I think we, we, I can't remember the exact temperature being that we used, but I don't think it was that high. So we, I think we had, I mean, <laughs> for our training set, I think we had between, what, one, I think four or 500 Kelvin between like, range of training, the training temperature data point, but then I conditioned on the temperature, so it shouldn't, like in the end, we, we use the same temperature when we evaluate this correlation structure. Um, so we generated only points that have very similar temperature. So yeah, I guess I can maybe talk to you a bit about this, yeah. Uh,